Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so happy that so many of you have uh, tuned in um, to hear um, the conversation. Um, my name is um, Alison Mears, and I'm an architect and co-director and co-founder of Healthy Materials Lab. This is the second in a series of events that we're having this semester, um, part of HML's Spring Material Health Series, celebrating the, uh, the launch and publication of our, of our new book, Material Health. So for those who are unfamiliar with our work, Healthy Materials Lab is a design-led research lab at Parsons School of Design in New York City. Our work puts people's health at the center of all of our design decisions. We raise awareness about toxics in our built environment, and we work to make, make healthier alternatives more accessible. Our particular focus is to support the design and construction of healthy, affordable housing. At HML, we understand that change begins when we ask questions, when we have conversations with people from a variety of disciplines, and where we question assumptions about design in practice. So I think, yeah, thank you, Hilary. Our presentation today is entitled Mithun, an integrated approach to material health in affordable housing. Today, we'll hear about the work of Mithun, who won the AIA's 2023 Architecture Firm Award. This practice adopts an interdisciplinary approach to design for health frameworks with internal and external practice processes and evolved strategies for implementation and overcoming barriers in a range of different contexts. Our guests today will present their work through a variety of project case studies. We are very grateful to have four members of the firm join us today. Please welcome a long-term friend of the lab, Hilary Knoll. Hilary is an architect and social impact designer specializing in sustainability. As sustainability integration leader, she serves as an expert design resource and process facilitator to advance building and site performance across the practice. Tammy Lee brings her deep experience in landscape design to focus on housing, including mixed use developments, student housing, and affordable housing. Annie Rummelhoff has worked on a variety of project types, including creative workspaces, student and affordable housing, civic and cultural spaces. And this range broadens her knowledge of opportunities and expands her approach to creative solutions. And lastly, Taylor Tesma Mogan is Methun's materials specialist, focused on advancing sustainability and health in the built environment. Our speakers today will share with us the strategies, victories, and challenges they face on the, world, on the road towards realizing their health and sustainability goals. Um, you can find much more extensive biographies on, that, on our website um, if you'd like to look into that. And before we start, I just have a few housekeeping notes. Um, so you'll see that the Q&A is open. And so while our guests are speaking, Feel free to add your questions in the question box at the bottom of the screen. If you see that someone else has asked a question that you like, give it a thumbs up and that pushes it top, to the top of the queue. Please use the Q&A for questions and not the chat box, even though there seems to be a lot of activity in the chat box right now. That's great for chatting with other, other folks who are here with us. But if you want your important question to be um, posed and answered, hopefully, um, put those questions in the Q&A. Um, also note that this event qualifies for one AIA CEU, which, in, which is an HSW credit. During the event, we'll share a link in the chat a couple of times so that you can uh, make sure you register for your certificate. So let's get started. We welcome Hilary, Tammy, Annie, and Taylor from Mithun. Welcome. Thank you so much, Allison. We're really excited to be here today and honored to be asked to join you all for this event. Before we dive in, we want to tell you a little bit more about who we are at Methune and um, just a little bit of background. 
We're an interdisciplinary collaborative of designers who believe in the power of design to create positive change and address challenges of our time. As a mission-driven firm, we're united through the belief of power in design to create positive change. Our office has three locations, um, but operate as one cohesive unit. And uh, as our firm-wide material specialist, Taylor uh, supports LA, but is located in Seattle with Tammy. And today, Hillary and I are coming to you from San Francisco. And although a majority of our projects are on in the Western United States, we are a national practice with projects all over the country. And we believe in design's vital capacity to connect people to one another through intentional and memorable experiences. And our approach is guided by four overarching principles that we're gonna share with you. We are centering equity in all aspects of our practice to help create a more just world. We dedicate about 1% of our annual revenue towards pro bono design and volunteer initiatives serving our communities. Methune was one of the first design firms to earn the ILFI's Just Label in 2017, which is a transparency tool to track progress on key social equity matrix. We engage in innovative research to solve increasingly complex design challenges, tackle global issues, and advance the profession. Methune R&D seeks to advance design knowledge and its application through internal projects, research, external partnerships, and intellectual research pursuits. Methune R&D transforms projects in design with meaningful inquiry and exploration. Since 2016, we have funded over a million dollars and 10,000 hours in R&D with participation from more than 100 Methune staff. The R&D works shows up in all projects across all disciplines and at a variety of scales and typologies. And to tackle those complex challenges, we've evolved from an architecture-centric practice to a really collaborative interdisciplinary model. Today, the panelists here range from interior designers to material specialists, architects, and landscape architects. And that interdisciplinary model extends beyond the immediate design team into a process that really engages the communities um, that we work with in co-design. By listening and observing to the lived experience of marginalized communities, we're better able to address many intersecting crises. And that co-design process with communities and partners is perhaps most apparent in our affordable housing work, which we're here to talk to you about today. We're excited to be here and share that experience in designing for health um, and healthy materials and affordable housing. And we're proud to say that that experience has given us the opportunity to be involved in the creation of over 5,000 affordable housing units um, with a whole range of mission-driven clients all over the country. And the fourth and uh, final foundational imperative behind Mithun's approach is a continuation of sustainable design leadership. Our firm has received over 300 awards nationwide since about 2000, including seven AIA COAT, that's the Committee on the Environment Award. We're proud to have designed net zero buildings, living buildings, eco districts, uh, and more than 100 LEED certified projects, including many at the um, gold and platinum levels. But behind all of these accolades and accomplishments are the people. Um, I'm inspired daily that I get to show up and work with colleagues and friends who champion this shared mission of sustainable design integration. Um, expertise, as you can see here, is, is shown throughout our firm on a wide variety of topics, from embodied carbon to bird-friendly building design. Um, and we're organized with a sustainability committee and respective working groups on these topical categories. And many of our projects do pursue, pursue these third-party certifications, um, such as LEED or Greenpoint rated or FitWell, but not all do and not all are able to. 
So integrating a firm-wide goal and sustainability principles into each and every one of the projects that comes through our door led us to create this baseline sustainability framework. As a firm, we felt that it's essential for all project typologies, scales, and locations to incorporate consistent, sustainable design thinking into their process. So the framework draws upon some of the prevalent rating systems and standards that many folks are probably familiar with, but it's less prescriptive and it's more adaptable. Shown here are the six categories with climate justice and social equity embedded at the center. Um, and they th thread through and show up throughout topics of resilience, water, well-being, ecosystem, energy, and materials. Um, I'll now, though, dive into our framework um, and the process of how we define health. Um, and you'll see that healthy materials is really just one component of that broader definition. Um, our process really begins begins with this acknowledgement that place is a primary determinant of health. The data is clear. A person's zip code is a more significant factor than their genetic code in predicting the health and quality of life. Social determinants of health are the root causes or the conditions in the places where people live, learn, work, play, um, and they affect a wide range of health risks and outcomes. They include things like economic opportunity, um, your neighborhood, your zip code, but aspects like open space and housing, the pieces that we as designers have the power to shape. Mithun led in some groundbreaking work um, just over 10 years ago with the Denver Housing Authority um, to establish one of the first ever health equity frameworks. Um, and this informed the design and planning standards for a major redevelopment of a public housing site in Denver. The process engaged public health practitioners as well as residents on the ground to prioritize their needs and health concerns. That work uh, went on to uh, and continues to go on to inform our affordable housing practice where we um, can think about healthy design guidelines really in four realms or four scales. The first is public space, um, thinking about this at the neighborhood or the block. So design elements might include active recreation, vibrant, ecologically functional landscapes, and public safety. Next, at the scale of the street, healthy design guidelines might show up as, uh, excuse me, might show up as pedestrian connectivity, clear wayfinding, um, placemaking, or more increasingly we think of as placekeeping when we consider anti-displacement strategies. Um, this might include culturally based public art. And then third, zooming in a bit further at the scale of a project site, design for health elements are social spaces, um, strategies around reducing hardscape and the urban heat island effect, which has major impacts on health and air quality. And then finally, um, at the scale of the building, that's probably where many folks here in the audience may have the most familiarity, or it may be the scale at which you think of first when you think about opportunities of designing for health and healthy materials. Um, but at this scale, you know, it also includes elements of, of active stairs, biophilic design principles, indoor air quality, and then of course, finally, the reduction of toxicant exposure through material selections. Uh, I wanted to touch upon a really pioneering project. Um, this was back in 2005 when Mithun designed the Breeze, Breathe Easy Homes. This was a pilot project um, in West Seattle for the High Point community. And the aim here was to reduce risk factors for childhood asthma. Um, this was a really robust process that included epidemiologists, public health practitioners, um, and was really one of the first clinically studied models um, of of reduction of um, aller allergen and asthmatic triggers through design. Uh, and the dramatic results that have been recorded are, are really, um, really profound and they continue to be tracked for many years since. There was a 67% reduction in urgent care and emergency room visits and a 61% increase in the number of symptom-free days for the families that lived here. Um, the design features were extensive. They ranged from low VOC materials to whole house filter ventilation and low allergen landscapes. 
Um, and as the asthma symptoms and triggers declined, family's quality of life improved. There were fewer sleepless nights, less lost work and school time, increased exercise and outdoor activities, and of course, lower medical expenses. So the pioneering projects such as Breathe Easy Homes and the Denver Healthy Living Framework have gone on to define our strategies within the materials and well-being categories of the Methune Baseline Sustainability Framework. Um, we're now going to um, dive into those, but actually, I do want to note that <clears throat> health and well-being elements also show up in our ecosystem strategies, in conversations about resilience, even conversations on water and stormwater. Um, and you're going to hear some of those stories today when we get to case studies. Uh, so design for well-being in the built environment can be really complex and daunting. Um, we've distilled it, not at the you know, the risk of oversimplification, but we have distilled it into five set of, in of intentions in the baseline framework um, with these five strategies shown here. First, with all project teams at the onset of a project, um, we prompt our teams to um, inquire where do health inequities exist um, and to perform some initial social determinants of health um, assessment for their own project site and with the communities that they're serving. Secondly, um, we know that movement is a central aspect of health. So all project teams are asked to look at active design elements, ergonomics, universal and safe design and circulation. Um, every project is asked to create an optimized indoor environment that's appropriate for their user group and is tailored to their bioregion and climate. So we're thinking about natural and enhanced ventilation, daylighting views, acoustics, and controllability of systems. And then finally, biophilic design, probably many of our favorite topics. I know it's one of mine. Um, each project team is asked to explore and implement at least two of the 15 biophilic design principles. So we ask, you know, how might we find ways big and small literal and metaphorical to enhance connections to natural systems. Biophilic design can reduce stress, enhance creativity and clarity of thought. It's been documented clinically to improve well-being and expedite healing. So as our world population continues to urbanize, um, and as we think about the work that we do with marginalized and historically harmed populations who've experienced trauma, these qualities and the opportunities for biophilic design can offer a profound impact. And now Taylor's gonna kick us off with um, our baseline framework on materials. Our intention for materials is for all project teams to design with foresight, avoid known harmful substances, encourage transparency, and use life cycle assessment. This intent is broken into four stages shown here. People in developed nations now spend an average of 90% of our time in buildings, making toxic exposure from materials a significant factor on all human health. It is important to consider that materials affect improve or harm health. All project teams are encouraged to conduct an LCA model to reduce embodied carbon, it's essential that we balance reducing embodied carbon with healthy material information in our design and specification process. We aim to advance material transparency and support all teams in their collection of at least 20 separate EPDs and HPDs or material transparency disclosures. We ask teams, how can our work with manufacturers, suppliers, and product representatives promote material transparency and disclosure of their products. The fourth principle to advance material health and innovation is centered on improving equity in the supply chain and uplifting local crafts and builders throughout sourcing unique design elements, including repurposed and regional materials. So let's talk about materials at Methuen. Our material labs are a natural collaboration space 
that provide education, inspiration, and advocate for healthy material selections that align with our sustainability goals and our JEDI framework. Product knowledge surrounding life cycles, global majority manufacturers, and social, social justice help our teams and clients make informed decisions for healthier designs. The labs really are the heart of our offices. So how, how we started or how we restarted. In 2020, at the start of the pandemic, we completely took apart and removed the existing lab in Seattle. This included the removal of products that did not meet health and sustainability standards. It was easier to start from scratch in order to truly evaluate materials, highlighting the importance of a well-organized library. We recently completed this process in San Francisco too. So what happened to all the materials? It was really important to us to eliminate waste. So we made donations, makers took the products, both in our offices and in the art community, or they went back to the manufacturers. What's in our labs? A personal passion of mine is our focus on local makers, starting with our offices and project locations. We have a database, which focuses on the actual products in our labs. And finally, materials in the lab are required to have certifications, transparency, including composition, sourcing, and work environments. We know you've seen the logos and are familiar. We have been building back the, lab, the Seattle lab gradually, taking our time to carefully curate what we keep on our shelves and specify on our project. San Francisco starts this process next week. How does our team best utilize our in-house material specialist role? As an interior designer myself and, and with a strong design skill set, everyone utilizes me differently and varies, on pro, varies per project and request. Um, one way is evaluating and vetting products and presentations. The team heavily leans on me to vet prior to products making it on our shelves. Mentorship, this happens with all disciplines and experience levels. I'm also learning from my peers. I also provide individual teams, individuals or teams with products, product options and information. For example, resilient flooring. I'll start with my top three recommend, recommendations and then we'll go from there. It is my job to know. And if I don't know the answer, I will find it out. Um, and then I provide inspiration or a different lens to look through, if you will. A quick charrette, guidance through throughout a project, the scale on material on an elevation, or how the product is applied. And lastly, without, and not limited to, um, I'm a connector, both internally and externally. Our labs are not set up by division but by natural progression of materials. Teams can sign out work tables for the day or periods of time. In addition to sustainability requirements, products in the lab are full reference sets and must be returned. This helps eliminate waste and duplicates. Features in the material lab are, we have a material wall display. This highlights new and exciting products. We also have a TV, TV for product presentations, team collaboration, or client presentations. We have adjustable color temperature track lighting. And lastly, a rotating lighting display and furniture vignette. Here's an overview of our database. The great thing about the database is that it reflects what is currently in our lab and has certifications attached to it. This eliminates time spent searching for those documents on the websites. When a representative brings in a new product, we remove something from their shelf. This helps keep the lab rotating product and continues to help it well, to be well organized. The contacts are listed by manufacturer and location. And lastly, the local and sustainable maker database is an ever growing list that highlights location and searchable by product category. 
The way we work is essential to the success of our projects. We recognize and appreciate that we as interior designers, architects, landscape architects, we are only one part of the whole project and not solely in charge of the final decisions. The team is going to share a little bit more from now from a per practitioner's perspective. Thanks, Taylor. Yeah, as Taylor stated, um, as designers on these projects, we don't make decisions in isolation and we know we're part of a much larger team of decision-making folks, clients, consultants, community partners. Um, we're gonna talk now um, about what we see in our experience as we're working on affordable housing projects, share some common threads we see across projects. Um, we're gonna start with typical project elements, but then into some barriers to entry for new healthy materials, um, some decision-making levers that we normally pull on are utilized to get them in, and then also some opportunities for impact we see as, as great possibilities. And um, what we're excited to share is that affordable housing really is leading the way in many of these, um, many of these aspects. Uh, leadership and clients really understand that housing is healthcare, and they understand the built environment's potential impact. So we don't always have to have that conversation first. There is often a strong mission alignment between our clients' goals and our sustainability and health focus. And while many of you know this on the call already, affordable housing, namely the LIHTC program, which stands for Low Income Housing Tax Credit, um, this can incentivize sustainability and performance and material choices. And to set the basis for the work we're going to talk about today, we thought we'd share some typical project aspects or elements to keep in mind. These projects are often new construction, primarily urban infill. They're either Greenpoint or some other third-party rating system, which is pretty consistent across the board, depending on location. Um, they have a variety of site elements, and that's where we're excited to have uh, landscape with Tammy here today. Uh, we really work in that integrated way, thinking about projects at all scales. Um, sometimes those are urban streetscapes, associated transit plazas, and then things on the interior like the lobby, service spaces, amenities, those all vary based on the affordable housing population that we're designing to. Um, and then one thing that we do see and a huge opportunity for impact, as Hillary mentioned, at the building scale, unit finish and unit finish standards are pretty typical across the board. So we love to see where we can pull on levers there because there's so much of that out there and so much that we need to build. And um, we're excited about that opportunity to, um, to really affect finishes at that human scale. So we're going to start with talking about some barriers to entry, and uh, don't worry, we'll get into the opportunities later. But with those elements, those typical elements in mind, uh, we do come up against a few barriers to entry when it comes to new or healthy materials. For one, a lack of familiarity or comfort with new materials. <clears throat> that word new is really exciting to us as designers. We love innovating. We love creating, you know, and, and moving the world forward. But we have to keep in mind that that does sometimes cause concern, especially with client and contractor teams. And so the goal is to vet materials well in advance, have a great understanding of what it means and get that whole team on board. That vetting is really essential to be able to develop, to work within um, and around developer design standards. These standards are used to help create consistency across properties and portfolios. Um, especially for certain, um, certain affordable housing developers who are doing a lot of great work in the world. And the standards are very well-meaning, um, but they can be difficult to change. So that's something that we, we see that we work on a lot. And then there's the realities of the construction phase. Um, maybe we did work with the standards. Maybe you did go on the site visit. Maybe you did the mock-up and tested the material and did all the work during the design phase. And then years later, when it comes to construction, all of that can change with a simple submittal for flooring, for instance. Um, volatile supply chains have been a real reality on a variety of projects over the last few years. I don't think I need to say that to anybody on this call. Um, so having you know, a really good backup 
having a whole list of backups, having a resource like Taylor, those things are incredibly important to be able to make quick game time decisions on projects. Next up, we're gonna talk about how these barriers to entry can often be overcome by pulling on or working with the right decision-making levers. As we've already mentioned, having a really strong partnership with the property management team is key. They are a huge aspect of decision-making, especially when it comes to those unit finishes, which we see as such a big opportunity in affordable housing. We really want these folks to be excited about the product. We want them to be able to keep it clean. We want them to be able to keep it well-maintained for the residents that will be in these spaces. They deserve that. Um, and being prepared with lots of information about new materials will serve the team really well. I always joke that it's always property management who pulls their keys out of their pocket and wants to try and scrape whatever it is that I'm trying to present in a meeting. So being prepared for that, being prepared for the catch-up test, all those kinds of things are really important. Also, already mentioned, funding sources can be a huge source of motivation for higher performing healthy materials. Health and sustainability is definitely important and our clients and our partners care deeply about it, but it's not always the number one decision-making lever, neither is aesthetics. And so we're gonna talk about how we're prioritizing some of those healthy materials on a variety of projects in our case studies. And as we get into these great opportunities for impact on projects, we've seen a really clear shift in recent years. Um, it's way more comfortable now to have a conversation with clients about healthy materials Awareness around them continues to grow and gather momentum, and this is thanks to a number of wonderful community partners that we and many others um, are working with so closely. Setting really strong project goals is essential to success. As Hillary mentioned earlier, we think at a variety of scales when it comes to health and wellness, and often when it comes to realizing healthy material in the final product or in the final project, um, having goals that were set sometimes at the neighborhood or the community scale may often be to thank for getting that material into the project. Lastly, um, we're here today because talking with manufacturers, clients, colleagues, and creating a much larger network of healthy materials, supporters, and advocates is really the biggest opportunity. Thanks for having us. So next, we're going to cover a few case studies to illustrate more of the specifics about this and this practitioner experience. What we want to highlight in these case studies for you is that healthy materials are just one part of a larger ecosystem of designing for health. So we'll go through some of those pieces we highlighted here um, on some of the projects we're really excited to share. Great. And first up um, in our case study is the recently completed Maseo May Apartments, which serves formerly homeless veterans and their families. Um, this is a new all-electric low-carbon building on San Francisco's Treasure Island. It provides 105 units of permanently affordable housing. The project utilizes modular construction and is pursuing FitWell certification to improve the health outcomes for this population. Uh, in addition to pursuing FitWell, um, our project was selected by the Green Health Partnership at the USGBC and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to be a pilot for the Integrative Process for Health Promotion. Um, so this meant that we held a special design, um, excuse me, a, health, a special, special health charrette in addition to our eco charrette right at the onset during schematic design. Um, and this was an opportunity to explore how we defined health, physical, mental, social, and economic well-being. Um, but it was really about questioning our default assumptions. We engaged the owners, service providers, and a public health practitioner. Um, and we looked at the, their top health concerns with this population of formerly homeless veterans, and then came up with corresponding design strategies to address those concerns. Um, for me personally, this is really the part of the project where the magic happens. Um, this is about deep listening and explorations that help our clients to commit to design innovation because they begin to see this value proposition and the value alignment. Um, they understand that the architecture can actually be an expression that supports their organizational mission, in this case, uplifting homeless veterans. Um, and what, why this is so key and why this is so magic is that it provides the, um, preserves the design moves later on down the line, like Annie was talking about during construction, when hard decisions come to bear, um, the clients often are able to stand by these decisions because of that mission alignment that's happened. 
Um, another framework that we employed at Maseo May um, and a number of other projects, frankly, across the firm in the affordable housing practice is Home Free. Um, and this is a tool to help inform healthy material selections. Um, Methun, as a, as a firm, broadly, we have an ongoing involvement and partnership with the Healthy Building Network um, and support this national program, which was co-created with affordable housing developers. Um, it's focused on marginalized communities and especially children who are disproportionately impacted by toxic chemicals. They target, this framework targets the commonly used products in multifamily residential construction and provides technical resources. Um, they use a new scientific methodology called the Avoided Hazards Index. Um, and this compares products and their chemical makeup so that product, project teams can make informed choices um, ultimately, Home Free is really looking to transform the affordable housing materials market at scale. Um, so the health threat process, our FitWell standard and Home Free all came together to inform decisions both within the units and throughout the building at Maseo May. Within the units, you know, we always have our standards of zero VOC um, sealants and paints. But some of the substitutions we were able to make um, included solid maple casework with non-urea formaldehyde carbon compliant backings um, in lieu of a, of a former standard that the developer had. Um, for trim work, um, we were able to eliminate all MDF and instead went with finger jointed solid pine trim. Um, and then at the countertops in lieu of uh, granite or solid stone, we went with an engineered solid surface. Um, finally, the flooring is an ortho phthalate free and in the bathrooms, a natural rubber flooring. I think the health threat process though, it really had the greatest impact and, and transformation on some of the common areas of the building. We drew upon the trauma informed design frameworks um, as well as biophilic design principles, which have been documented to have clinic with clinical trials to reduce some of the triggers associated with PTSD um, and a number of other the health concerns with this population. Um, so what this looked like were common areas are arranged spatially with always having two pathways out. We uh, included ideas and, and spatial arrangement, arrangements of prospect and refuge. All passageways and doors have views through them. And then finally, natural materials are included wherever possible um, shown here is the wood slat finishes in the community room and ground floor spaces. Um, I think all in all, the, the way to summarize the design for health and Maseo May is that it's a holistic and multi-benefit approach to integrating health and sustainable design features. As I alluded to earlier, things like stormwater and energy and resilience all are tied up in how we define and think about health. Um, so you can see here that the, this is probably a diagram for much more detail, but the large ground floor community room is actually designed as a resilience hub. And this came out of our design charrette or health charrette process with the client. That resilience hub provides backup power with a microgrid to ensure refrigeration of essential medications for a lot of residents who have um, vulnerabilities and health conditions. There's Wi-Fi and backup power and then filtered and conditioned air to serve as a cooling center during hazardous wildfire impacts and heat waves. Um, so I hope that this illustrates that material selection and indoor environmental quality is just one piece of a really broad definition of, of healthy design and affordable housing. And now we're gonna head up to Seattle to look at the Liberty Bank Building. Our next case study is Liberty Bank Building. Um, this project builds upon the legacy and the original site of the Liberty Bank, the first African-American owned bank in the Pacific Northwest. It was established in 1968 in response to re redlining and disinvestment in Seattle Central District, a historically African-American community. The new Liberty Bank building provides 115 permanently affordable homes for households at or below 60% AMI. As you heard about Home Free from Hillary, Liberty Bank also serves as a demonstration for Home Free Standard. The design team worked with Healthy Building Network to analyze and select healthier and less toxic building materials beyond the typical portfolio of sustainable materials, including insulation, flooring, and countertops. 
Biophilic design and healthy living strategies are incorporated throughout the project to support residents' well being. At the entry, residents and visitors enter the building via a wooden bridge over a bioretention planter fed by a runo animated with salmon sculptures. Just inside, a centrally located stair promotes active living and encourages residents to take stairs rather than elevators. On the upper residential floors, a large operable window at each corridor brings in light, views, and fresh air. A health-centric health design is just a part of designing for health. We wanted to ensure residents had a sense of belonging when entering the space. Inspired by Afrocentric design principles, the facade's dynamic pattern and bold color reflect the way individual stories form a collective expression. The design honors the original Liberty Bank by incorporating the salvaged brick from the original building into the facade. And by displaying the original bank vault doors in the residential lobby as a conceptual art piece. We featured the original Liberty Bank logo at the corner of the building that can be seen on the picture to the left here. A total of eight local African American artists were commissioned to create and install permanent artworks that serve as living cultural monuments to the Liberty, uh, to the black local black community. One example is a continuous, uh, can, continuous canopy ribbon art that is integrated into the canopy edge, also seen on the image to the left here. On the image to the right, you can see a glass canopy that depicts the historic red line map of the Central District. In total, over 30 pieces of art was installed in or around the building. Um, incorporating culture art instills a sense of belonging and placekeeping. This is clinically demonstrated to improve health outcomes in historically marginalized communities. To prevent displacement and demonstrate placekeeping, the project developer committed to offer commercial space at affordable rates for established black owned and WMBE businesses in the neighborhood. Our next case study is still in design phases. This project in San Francisco is located between the Mission and the Potrero neighborhoods. This new project will house 73 units for young families transi transitioning out of homelessness. With abundant community artwork, additional space for homeless prenatal program, nonprofit office, offices, and wonderful outdoor spaces, this project plans to open in a couple years, in 2025. In this project, the site offers a unique programming opportunity. Some years back, Homeless Prenatal purchased the site direct, directly adjacent to their existing facility. The, this new housing project, which they are doing in partnership with an affordable housing developer, offers the opportunity for them to expand their housing program and gain some additional space for new entry and client serving spaces. In between the new and existing building lies the opportunity to create a deep community connection with rich interconnected multi-level gardens that will also flow into, their, into the interior environments, offering views of biophilic design, qualities throughout the housing and nonprofit spaces. These spaces build on a well-loved garden that the existing nonprofit has been growing for years. As part of the visioning for the project, the organization identified four pillars for success, healthy babies and families being number one. With those goals in mind, the team is working to prioritize high touch surfaces. This means thinking about materials at lower levels of the exterior building and the interior environment that will stimulate human engagement in a safe and healthy way. And here we have Casa Adelante at 2060 Folsom. This project offers 127 permanently affordable units for families in Tay. 
TAE stands for transitional age youth, which are foster youth transitioning into adulthood. Um, and while there's many things we'd like to tell you about this recently completed project, we'll focus today on the use of healthy materials to support really strong indoor-outdoor spaces. The project also has a unique site similar to Homeless Prenatal. Um, this one happens to be directly adjacent to a community park. What this offered to the team was a great opportunity to create a mid-block paseo um, with a really active ground floor and a high level of street frontage for wonderful community nonprofits. Above is the split massing that decreases the length of the interior corridor for the residential spaces. And in between those two massing elements, there's an open air bridge that allows for additional views, windows, and outdoor space at the residential levels. Outdoor space at the residential levels is something we don't see very frequently in all affordable housing projects. So this was a unique opportunity. The top right image um, on this slide shows that open air bridge. And as Hillary mentioned earlier, we really love playing with the biophilic design elements. And you can see that dappled light coming across the panels here and washing the floor in between those two residential blocks. To the left, you'll see a painted lobby mural, which is inspired by the historic Mission Creek, which once used to run through this site. At the lower left, you'll see a bioretention planter. It's currently being used as a really great play structure um, that also references the creek, connects to that lobby mural, and supports the growth of native planting. Um, this conceptual thread about indoor-outdoor spaces and healthy air is also present in the technical execution of this project. Um, while 84.5% of regularly occupied spaces have access to operable windows, this project was also one of the first to support the flow of healthy air with an HRV system that provides continuously filtered fresh air to all the residential units. And while some of these features are present at that larger building scale, here we wanna talk a little bit more about the human scale, a little bit um, more intimate. At the left, you're seeing um, a certified clean air gold stacking chair that we really love and was selected to support the flexible interior and exterior space at both the community room and courtyard. So that chair runs into both spaces and can be stacked and changed and really flexibly used. And similarly to the right, um, this great lounge chair that achieved cradle to cradle bronze and now serves residents a place to relax and actually look out over the community park just next door. Lastly, we use Green Guard Gold rubber flooring as a resilient surface underfoot in the corridors. And it's also a great pop of color. Um, so if we go back just one slide, that lively pop of color throughout the project really highlights some of these design features and that indoor-outdoor. Um, we're trying to use materials to encourage people to move through the space and engage with those, those healthier indoor-outdoor spaces. And um, so you can see that pop of color in the mail room on the right-hand side here in the community room and then the chairs in the courtyard adjacent. You actually move through that exterior space to get to the elevators and everything. And what we're proud to say is that um, we sat here with a whole bunch of residents out in the courtyard and did a couple of rounds of a post-occupancy evaluation. And we've heard back that 62% of residents feel that their household health has improved since living in this project. Residents' well-being can also be improved by community engagement. One of our R&D grants funded a collaboration with the local community food garden group, San Francisco Recreation and Park, and Berkeley Bee Lab to establish test plots for native pollinators in the community garden adjacent to the site. The research project investigates the most effective combination of plants and soil types to encourage na native pollinators. This project allowed us to achieve long-term community connections as well as establish a plant palette for the site that continues to support pollination of the community's food garden post-construction. As Annie mentioned before, the project is located on what, what, once, what was once Mission Creek and wetland habitats. Those important habitats were infilled over time as part of urbanization of San Francisco resulting in impermeable and flood-prone conditions on the site 
and within the Mission Bay neighborhood, oh, Mission neighborhood, apologies. Uh, the design responds to the hidden ecology by balancing outdoor amenity spaces with contemporary stormwater design techniques that reconnects the drainage to the highly permeable soils that lie beneath the existing urban fill. I love this image because it encapsulates the many of the healthy building site features coming together. The view down this public paseo shows the permeable pavers, which has silver cells hidden beneath it, the biophilic patterns of the metal screens, and are the natural wood shading devices meeting the, meeting the pollinator pathway garden and park. Our team was so inspired by the pollinator garden that we selected hexagonal pavers um, as a metaphor for the beehives and the interiors matched it with their tile selection. Jumping into a different variety of case studies, this is a case study um, as is, that is an example of a barrier to entry using reed climbed wood. Summer Oaks is an affordable housing project currently under development in California. The project is to offer 72 units of affordable family housing on a two acre site with existing native oaks. Because the project will require the removal of a lot of existing trees, the team thought it would be a great opportunity to reuse the existing wood on site. Of course, the contractor and client wasn't super thrilled about this. <laughs> they are definitely not as excited as us. So our colleague, Alyssa, went out on site and cataloged all the wood that could be reused. And then she mapped it out as a tree log forest to graphically demonstrate the amount of usable wood available on site. When she tallied the total wood and rated it at the current market value to show the contractor, she wanted to show the contractor and client what a valuable resource that they had on site. And in total, we had over 40,000 board feet of lumber. And that equates to about 2.6 like average American wood homes, which is mind blowing. Um, and the wood, if and if the wood is milled and dried, it can be valued at over a million dollars. Um, so since this was an atypical, a typical process for the contractor owner, the team did a deep dive into cataloging and detailing how each piece of wood would be utilized in the new project. And this helped to convince the contractor and client um, that this was definitely something that we could do on the project. And I think they're right now on board with the project. I'm gonna hop into a different topic for our landscape and that is um, artificial turf in affordable homes and other family and children serving spaces. Um, as you can see here on the Home Free website, artificial turf with rubber crumb is ranked like the worst on the hazard spectrum. And as designers, we are always interested in making more informed decisions when specifying artificial turf, and especially in projects of affordable housing, in low income housing, and daycares um, where there's just a lot of children interacting with the turf. So we partnered with University of Washington to study the use, installation, and safety of artificial turf. Their team of researchers will be studying the environmental, social, and economic impacts and our benefits of artificial turf in real world installations. Seen here is um, UW Portage Bay Daycare, um, a Mithun project completed in 2016. It is being used as one of our case study sites for the study, along with an affordable housing building, affordable housing project another daycare, an elementary school, and a public park. The project is still starting, so we don't have any definitive results yet, but we are looking forward to seeing what those results bring so that we can make a more informed decision when selecting artificial turf. And lastly, not only do we need to consider the health of the users and residents of our site, we should take into account the installers and fabricators that the products of the products we use. 
Recently, we have been specifying acid etch finished concrete rather than sandblasting because dust from sandblasting can be super harmful to the lungs of the contractors installing sand, um, sandblasting. Um, while acid etch is a topical solution applied to concrete and then washed off for the same effect. And instead of specifying hot mix asphalt, you can specify warm mix asphalt, which has lower emissions of toxic fumes that can be harmful to the workers, um, workers making and installing asphalt. To conclude, these other health considerations underscore the important reminder that there are many aspects to material health and wellness that needs to be considered when working on projects. Tammy is exactly right. It's not just about material health at one level. There's many people to consider, many supply chains to consider, um, residents, all of that. And so as we're you know, thinking about the bigger picture, it just flows that we also need to evaluate the success of our choices. I think I saw something about this in the chat as a question, and we do do post-occupancy evaluations and studies on our projects. We're gonna tell you a little bit more about that. The way that our office works, um, we uh, have an initiative, what we call a design analytic, analytics initiative, and it expands our understanding of real user behavior across all projects and sectors through a broad base of evaluation and interview tools. Um, it's a form of deep listening that not only helps us improve our work, but also operations. We understand quality of life of our residents better and offers us the opportunity to evaluate the success um, and measure that design for positive change that we talked about. And so um, the next slide just shows an example of what one page of uh, many pages of post-occupancy reports look like. And Hillary now is going to tell you about some of the work we've been doing with the affordable housing post-occupancy evaluations, which um, we actually ran in multiple languages, which was a unique challenge that we had not done before. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the, de <clears throat> excuse me, the deployment and um, outreach um, uh, for these um, with residents is something maybe we can get to in Q&A, really complex and, and a fun challenge. Um, but in recent years, um, we've completed a number of these POUEs um, with our affordable housing clients. Um, we typically circle back after a project has had occupancy for about one year. The primary data collection um, is typically a resident survey um, deployed in a number of formats, both in person and digital. Um, we have a lot of support um, to encourage a, a high level of response rates. Um, and then we also um, engage property management um, operations and service providers, sometimes through interviews to capture their experiences. Um, this is just a snapshot of, of how that data is visualized in our reports um, and, and outcomes around health and well-being have been quite encouraging on a, on a cohort of recent projects. Um, this is with our one nonprofit, the Tenderloin Neighborhood um, Community Center, and 80% of rev residents felt that living here had um, allowed them to lead a healthier lifestyle. Well, 74% felt that the health and the health of their household members had improved as a result of living um, in, this, in this project. Um, really, um, I think what we, what we glean from these POE and design analytics, um, as Annie alluded to, is the in importance of a robust, inclusive, and deep listening engagement process at the onset. Um, but that early engagement, it's like a big circular process, right? These POEs inform the types of questions we're able to ask at the onset of a new project. Um, and by confronting the realities of how buildings are lived in and how they're operated, they may be realities different than what we imagined as the designer. Um, that gives us the ability to propose thoughtful solutions that meet the true needs of resident well being. And so with that, um, that summarizes our formal presentation, and I think we'll kick it back to Allison to take questions. Thank you all so much. Amazing, thank you. Thank you very, very, very much. There's a lot of enthusiastic questions and comments um, from the audience. So let's jump in and, um, and, and answer some of those questions. I just wanted to start with a question because it seems like from your Breathe Easy, Breathe Easy House, to today, there's been a kind of tremendous growth in the way that you 
think about affordable housing um, and the, the potential that you see within it to really advance and support the health of the residents. As you look at the future in the next five years, I mean, it's very difficult to do this as we know, but what do you think are some of the, um, of the challenges and possible opportunities that you'll be facing as a firm going forward? Uh, I think that there's like gonna be um, increased pressure on cost containment per unit for affordable housing. Um, but I'm also hopeful for opportunities to work with um, manufacturers and align um, with our sustainability goals and um, healthier, healthier material options, as well as our design communities. This is not a cost containment option, um, but uh, I'm really excited about conversion. Um, and this is a super hot topic right now. The New York Times just did an amazing article with really wonderful graphics to describe the difficulties, you know, some of those barriers to entry um, for conversion. Um, it's pretty expensive to do, and it's a little tricky in terms of the building stock. But I think there's a huge opportunity. I think I saw a question in the chat about, you know, a lot of what we presented today was new construction, affordable housing. That's not always possible. A lot of things are renovations and we recognize that. Um, and uh, I think those opportunities are, are huge and the industry as a whole should really work, spend some time working to figure out how to, how to do that. And, there's a lot of space out there that could be used for affordable housing. So I'm really excited to see what happens with that in the next few years. Okay, well, let's jump into a few more questions. Um, I noted a, um, that Taylor talked about um, offering up her three favorite resilient flooring um, options um, to, um, uh, the architects designers in the office and I'm imagining her affordable housing uh, friends as well um, and that seemed to spark a, a number of different questions and so I think people are looking generally particularly on really fixed budgets for alternatives to LVT which you know, I, I imagine you like we consider that to be a terrible choice and something we would never specify so um, Taylor could you give us some insight into your favorite resilient flooring products? Sure. Well, it, it obviously will depend on the product or project. Um, but my top three that I typically go for are um, Pure Line, which is a bio-based. Um, Shaw Contract just came out with a bio-based as well. Um, I'm, I'm really leaning into that at the moment. Um, there is, um, let's see, Marmoleum's always a, a good option. Um, and then one wood, wood look is um, Moto by Inhaus. Um, I'm really loving that product as well. Um, so those are kind of my starters, um, but of course those ebb and flow with the project type and um, new product releases. Um, budget constraints, of course. So one thing that we, you know, we start there. And then if we have to VE down, we always try to do, go um, phthalate free at least um, with the understanding, you know, that we can't always achieve it all, right? But we can we can um, at least put our best foot forward. That's great. And, yeah. and, you know, as I'm sure this, sorry, Hilary, as, as this audience understands that really having products that have been used in affordable housing and meet those other criteria that affordable houses have besides budget, which is kind of that performance and maintenance criteria is also really important. So that's valuable information. Sorry, Hilary, what were you going to say? I just wanted to reiterate um, Taylor's sort of the, the second half of Taylor's mm -hmm. response. Um, in that I do see some questions here of others struggling to eliminate LVT. And mm -hmm. um, that is that is absolutely where our firm is at as well. Um, the um, It is a persistent chemical in our environment, it is also a persistent product in our um, in client preferences. And uh, 
you know, I would just say more broadly, there are these bio-based products emerging as resilient flooring substitutes, but they're often um, a, poly, a polyurethane based product as well, which it turns out for as, as nasty as polyvinyl chloride is and its associated dox, dioxin emissions, um, it is a recyclable product, um, whereas polyurethane is not. So it's just a, it's sticky and it's a, it's a real, it's a real tough challenge for the market. Um, we need to continue to put that pressure again. This is about market transformation and put the pressure on manufacturers to um, work with their chemists and work with their environmental engineers um, to deliver cost-effective products. Um, we're just not where we need to be yet, uh, I would say, and that's maybe a little. It could be discouraging, but it's it's the reality. One other lever to pull on there is just to, this sounds a little bit low bar, but just reduce the amount of it. You know, if it has to be in the units, uh, you know, sometimes that's a reality of certain projects. Maybe don't put it in the corridors also. Um, on a few of our projects, we're exploring a variety of flooring types. I think we've um, used marmalium that Taylor mentioned. Um, we've used uh, just concrete. Um, as an option, we've also used rubber. Depending on the client, they might explore different things. You know, removing more of it from the project um, is also a, a way of reducing the amount in design. That's, that's great. Um, also, um, folks who are listening can go to um, you know our materials collections. We have very similar um, recommendations too in terms of resilient flooring, but also some of that spec guidance and best practices that could help you in terms of the decision-making um, that you're doing too. So I think um, all of those things are important. Those ongoing conversations definitely with, um, with manufacturers are hugely important for all of us to have, you know, when we ask, we ask at least baseline for transparency and for then these other sustainability um, characteristics, I think are, are really important. There are a couple of questions about embodied carbon. And so um, uh, thinking, uh, you know, that that is becoming more and more important in all of our work. And, and if you could speak to the kind of research you may do on materials and the embodied carbon content of the materials that you're specifying, um, and um, whether you're also thinking of, you know, the circularity um, of the buildings that you're designing and to speak a little bit about that. Absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to kick that off. Um, in 2007, Methune was the first firm to launch a, an embodied carbon calculator, which is open source and free. That website is still live today. It is called buildcarbonneutral.com or .org. Um, and we actually just received an AIA Upjohn grant to refresh that calculator um, and expand um, the, the database and the inputs in it. Um, but gosh, what um, just explosive growth and emphasis on embodied carbon in recent years. We named, um, we sort of designated the year of 2020 as the, the year of embodied carbon for our firm. The goal there was to increase everyone's eco-literacy on projects um, and come up with kind of simple rules of thumb for reduction. So your first um, and biggest impact is going to be on building structure. Um, so starting there with um, SCM's really robust and low carbon concrete mixes um, and rethinking structures and, and structural efficiency at large, um, quite a bit of growth in, in mass timber as well, which is really exciting to see. Um, and then moving past the structure into, into materials and those other divisions that maybe we have more control over as, as architects and designers. Um, next kind of the worst culprit is drywall, is gypsum, gypsum board. Um, there are two products now that are consistently cost equivalent to the convention, which is awesome to see. Um, so there's, um, it's an eco board, I think is the, um, it's in type X. So it's um, available in, in all um, fire rating requirements that we need. Um, and it's a 40% lower embodied carbon. So when you add up, I mean, the amount of drywall in these projects is astounding. Um, and then moving um, from drywall, it's looking at insulation. Fortunately, there's some really good crossover with our healthy um, healthy material goals with insulation in the and with embodied carbon, um, mineral wool, both in bat and rigid board in form, 
um, are having quite a bit of, um, of traction. Um, I think most of the case studies we showed today had mineral wool for all of the continuous exterior insulation in lieu of any foams. Um, so we're, we're getting rid of a lot of those poly ISO and, and EPS and XPS on our rigid exterior requirements for, uh, for meeting energy code. Um, and then from there, getting into interiors would be um, nylon carpet. So um, I, I think we had a we do these sustainability snacks at each of our staff meeting, and we had a great deep dive on nylon carpet and the embodied carbon and toxicity concerns of that. Um, Interface has some new net zero. Um, uh, I think they're made from recycled fishing nets. Maybe Annie, you know more about that. There's um, one of those, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's a few now. There's probably um, probably each manufacturer is putting a lot of emphasis on. Um, on nylon carpet. So those are kind of the top five materials we start with. That's where you're going to get like 70% of that, that embodied carbon target reduction. Um, and then, yeah, uh -huh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, was, please. This is like, Hillary is totally, I appreciate Hillary nerding out on the information here. Like, I'm sure that's really helpful to a lot of people. I don't want to cut you off, Hillary. But I also wanted to talk about just like on the design side, um, like the choices that you can make. Uh, this is a much smaller scale example, but we actually just moved our San Francisco office. And in the design choices we made on that, if you are working on smaller scale projects, if you do have more time to dedicate to thinking creatively about reuse and things like that, um, we, I, we don't have the exact carbon numbers back yet, but we are evaluating the carbon that we saved from reuse desks. Um, we pulled over a lot of um, the materials we actually had from our office, this acoustic panel that's behind me, we pulled off the wall and brought over to the new space and reused it. So things like that. And then one of the interesting things that connects back to our affordable housing work, I was talking with Evie in our office, who's um, finishing up a project for Balboa Upper Yard Housing, also called Capuso in San Francisco. And she was, we were walking to a happy hour and she was like, I'm so sad. The mock-up is just going to get thrown away. And it was like a whole kitchen mock-up for, for the project. <clears throat> and I was working on the new office design. I said, why don't we use the casework from the mock-up for our casework in our new office? And so now I'm sitting just down the hallway from um, that reuse story. Again, contractors were like, what are you guys doing? This is so complicated. It's so small. Um, but it was really important to us. And um, we even have reuse artwork. There was like a damaged panel at another affordable housing project. We brought that over as um, a, an artwork piece also in the kitchen. So if you have the opportunity to work on those smaller scale things and those little stories, that's also a really great way to have a you know, smaller impact, but still a, a great one. That's great. It, you know, we have to be inventive and designers all the way through the process and forever, right? As we, we uh, yeah, when we confront the challenges of embodied carbon, absolutely. Um, I was struck by the beautiful image that Tammy showed to the Paseo, uh, where she said it embodied all of the, the wonderful qualities, um, I think, of, of their buildings and um, and also the documentation of the lumber on, on site. Amazing that a uh, series of diagrams um, that convinced, potentially convinced the contractor that you could use that wood. Um, I'm teaching this uh, studio this semester. We were looking at exactly that issue. So I'm happy to take that information and say, yes, guys, you know, this is possible in the real world. Um, uh, Rowan, um, in one of the questions towards the bottom, also talked about um, this kind of balance between how we think about the landscape as a as a useful place and also potentially as a as a way to manage and mediate um, environmental climate challenges with the needs of bees and local fauna, um, and also the needs of reducing allergens for families. I wonder if you could address that, Tammy. Are you you talking about how we select plants to? Um, yeah, sure to, to support that... yeah to support the local ecosystem or create a new ecosystem, and then some of the challenges with if we we think about the Breathe Easy uh, project, um, you know the asthmogens or you know uh, allergic reactions to uh, pollen potentially in plants. Totally. Um, 
we definitely lean heavier towards our pollination pollinator and planting native especially um, in california where we also want to focus on drought tolerant plants um, to make sure we're not, uh, conserving water as well um, so i there is all it is always tricky trying to balance that the healthy health pollination allergen aspect with trying to boost uh, native plants that also flower that can encourage native pollinators. Um, but we definitely do our best where we can to plant native and promote the local ecosystem. We definitely study whatever the best habitat, like take into account lighting, shading, water usage um, before picking our plant palette for these places. Um, yeah, sorry and if I, I did. I think, get no, I think it's good. I think this is a perfect integrated design response, right? Because we need to both are both are incredibly important. Um, and as sort of on the architect side, I think it's our responsibility to work with our mechanical engineers um, to think about filtration. Um, Annie mentioned that 2060 Folsom was the first affordable project in San Francisco to have continuous filtered air through an HRV, a heat recovery ventilator, for every single unit. Um, Maseo May also followed suit with that technology, and, and I think most of the others now are. Um, that was before code required it. But increasing um, to MERV 13 filtration, thinking about HEPA filtration, so that we can ensure indoor air quality where people do spend the majority of their time, um, and be designing for all species, right? We're not the only one um, that we need to be thinking about. Helpful. Um, another kind of uh, question in the embodied carbon and thinking about the circularity of our buildings from Bethany asking about, um, you know, considering the afterlife of the materials, the products that you choose and thinking about uh, whether you design for disassembly at all. So that kind of uh, continuing um, use of a, of a product beyond its first life. I, I'm going to answer quickly and kick it to Annie because I think in affordable housing, one of one of the great things is that our clients hold on to and own and operate these properties for 30, 40, 50 more years. Um, so we're thinking a lot about durability. Um, and there's it's not a rapid um, change of use or and I think so I think design for disassembly, there's not a, a change of occupancy type is less of a priority in affordable housing for the most part. But I think in say sectors like our creative workplace practice, um, that's more top of mind. Annie, do you have? Yeah, and um, even beyond just um, creative workplace, you know, a lot of our clients are coming up to us today saying we need maximum flexibility. We don't know what things are gonna look like in five years. We don't know that either, so we can't really answer that for them, but we can ask a variety of questions where we can get there together. Um, and so we do see that in a lot of our work. Um, I'm working with um, a, a Jewish temple right now who um, has a space that they currently use for a whole variety of events. And, you know, thinking about storage is super important so things can be put away and then come out for when they want it on day to day. So that's less about, sorry, your question is specifically about disassembly, which I think is a really great question to ask. But I've taken it to the flexibility route and designing for maximal flexibility is something we are absolutely seeing and trying to accommodate. Um, another way of thinking about that is creating really timeless spaces that maybe don't need to be disassembled, but can be repurposed. One of the things we love about both of, um, with, um, free offices, but, uh, all of them are in great architectural spaces that have been around for many of them, almost a hundred years that we've just re repurposed the interior of the space to make them work. Um, we were really thoughtful about what we repurposed in our new redesign in San Francisco, same in Seattle, um, thinking about how to make things work for the long term. Um, disassembly is a really interesting question that I maybe don't have quite the right answer to. I don't know, Tammy and Taylor. Tammy, maybe in the landscape components, is there anything unique that you're looking at in terms of disassembly? I 
I think a lot of our pieces, like I would think it's more like say a park project, maintenance is always concerned about like it gets graffitied on, someone scratched it up, like can it be replaced? So we're definitely looking at things that um, sustainable materials that can be easily replaced and that often defaults to like a wood top bench that's easily mounted onto like a concrete um, block essentially. And then it can easily be taken off, unscrewed, popped off wherever pieces are ruined and then pop put back on. But the, like say the wood itself is like, as long as we make sure we don't specify like pressure treated wood, like thermary is like a great choice. It uh, is a hundred percent chemical free and it will biodegrade over time. So it's like totally could be composted. So those are definitely like considerations we take into account when specifying like furniture that is likely to get damaged. That's great. That was super helpful. I have a question about low income housing tax credits. As we all know, that's a kind of interesting space. And you did mention at the very beginning of your presentation that, you know, in um, on the West Coast, um, California and in Seattle, there are incentives for, for greener and healthier building um, uh, for credits within the QAP for, um, for, for working within healthier and greener, more sustainable buildings. So I noted one question here, and I'm just trying to find where it was about, I think, working in Louisiana, um, where that is an, an initiative that is part of the state um, uh, QAP process, right? Louisiana, right, has a minimum has minimal green building standards, and she and they have not seen any uh, anything in the QAP related to healthy materials. Curious to hear, just yeah. as a general question, you know how I don't think I've ever surveyed this, but but how do we see this nationally as an issue when it comes to access yeah. to these this kind of funding? Mm -hmm. Right. So the LIHTC program is distributed to each state. And so the policy making that determines what criteria is in that QAP, the qualified allocation plan of a state's LIHTC distribution um, is a state by state basis. So if folks say in Louisiana, um, that advocacy work should be centered statewide. Um, I do know that a number of years ago, um, Enterprise Green Communities did a huge amount of advocacy work um, I believe that Enterprise Green Communities is now in the qualified allocation plan for nearly all 50 states. Similarly, um, Passive House as a certification for low energy and, and good indoor air quality criteria was it has been adopted in 36 states. Um, and that's just been really the result of a couple of very determined, very persuasive advocates um, who have spent time um, with representatives and with the housing authorities of their respective states. Um, so that's how to do it on a statewide state basis. There are also federal funding programs. Um, we have HUD uh, with the veteran side, there's VASH and, and VHIP. Um, those uh, criteria are informed um, at federal policy making levels. Um, and they do include, um, they do include some criteria around health and well-being. Um, I would say um, less less so than maybe what we see in the LIHTC program. Um, I don't know, does that answer, is that if the question is how to affect change or how to impact those, it's, yeah, it's really a policy making um, piece yeah. for which we need architects and designers to contribute to that. And um, I think yeah. our, our piece is showing demonstration, return on investment, the value add of including these. Um, and, and you're gonna say something, but one, one drawback, and the reason we're getting some pushback in some states about the qualified allocation plan, the QAP criteria, is that affordable housing is being asked to solve all of our society's problems. It's being asked to solve homelessness, houselessness, the mental health crises, environmental. Um, it's just, it's a layer, and, and people sort of attribute like a death by a thousand cuts. Can, can a project truly solve all of these compounding crises in one fell swoop, and should they be asked to? Um, so there's just a lot of tensions there around cost containment and what problems we're trying to solve through through design and housing. 
Benny, yeah. you were going to jump in. <laughs> I have a totally different angle, um, yeah. which may or may not be helpful. It, it doesn't answer specific questions about the QAPs or um, the LIHTC program, but one of the, I have worked in Louisiana and um, it's, uh, <clears throat> I didn't have to convince this this particular client um, of health or sustainability goals. But one of the things they did get excited about was when we offered up solutions that were both healthy and healthier and sustainable, but connected back to who they were. And so um, that, that material that Hillary mentioned earlier, the interface flooring, I think it's called net effect, that's from um, recycled fishing nets. The Ch Children's Museum that we worked with used it because they thought it was just a really cool story. And Louisiana does have such a big fishing and like kind of, you know, that story and that concept connected for them. And so if you can find ways in on your materials or on your choices that connect back to the place, to the people, to the client in a different way, maybe you can get what you're looking for, but at a different angle, just an opportunity there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Excellent. Um, let's do one more question um, because we're almost at the um, half hour point. Um, and this question about social supply chain equity. And they noticed that the Design for Freedom logo was incorporated in one of your slides and wonder how you incorporate the toolkit into your vetting process. Taylor, I'm I'm looking to you, but I feel like I'm I'm, I'm answering a lot of questions. I mean, I can just say that um, we've had um, I know the director of the program well um, through past work at the ILFI, and um, uh, they're just doing phenomenal work in in addressing forced labor and and slavery along the supply chain. I know that they're just getting going with the actual tools for designers and guidance around specifications. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had a number of trainings with their program um, and we're, we're very eager to incorporate um, more of those practices when they become apparent. There's so, it's such a complex topic with so many layers and so many hidden conditions. There's just a lack of transparency right now in those disclosures. Um, and I know I'm inspired by a few of our peer firms who are choosing to go about this in different ways. One firm is, for instance, just selecting a single product. Um, I think they've chosen drywall um, and they're solely tracking social equity and forced labor along this, the entire life cycle of gypsum, right? So there's a lot of ways to go about this because it's a very overwhelming and daunting um, thing to take on as designers. We have limited time in our ability to research projects. So we really are gonna rely on frameworks and organizations to, to do that legwork and, and the disclosures. I agree. Yeah, it's it's about a partnership within our community, our design community. Um, and, and yeah, just scratching the surface on that, it's, you know, when we are looking at materials, whether it, they are new products or, um, you know, uh, veteran companies in, in our, um, in our wheelhouse, um, you know, asking the question is number one. And, um, you know, I'm guilty. I, I hadn't started asking the question before, um, you know, a couple of years ago. And it's, it's, it's really fascinating those that are really um, forthcoming with the information and those that don't know or um, that kind of um, teeter around around the conversation. So it's it's just about the visibility and the transparency. So I encourage you to ask, just ask questions. Yeah, and I would say we were gonna include, yeah, John Sarah put in the chat, uh, Jim Bullett, um, as CH's uh, recent research around the use of forced labor to um, create the ingredients for LBT in China, something to look at. It's a fantastic article and um, it could push you <laughs> to never use LBT again. So um, really important research, really important work there. I think that's it. That was amazing, guys. So many good questions, really good, uh, uh, really good uh, 
uh, information and exciting ideas and um, I think inspiring all of us to do more than we possibly could do, but um, pushing us to the next to the next level of really thinking about health in this very holistic, important way. So thank you to Hillary, for, to Tammy, Annie, Taylor, for your generous time and expertise, um, a conversation that we hope will continue as we move forward. Um, and we wanted to remind everybody who's left um, that we have another, the final in our spring um, series um, a presentation on May 3rd with Kaim Paints, who'll present um, a presentation entitled Mineral Paint, Rock Beats Plastic. Um, part of uh, um, our, you know, mission to uh, remove fossil fuels, basically, as ingredients from our buildings. Um, and again, the link to the CEUs is in the chat. Thank you all for coming. It was exciting. Thanks, everyone.